I saw my grandson trying to go down a road that he should not have gone down. It was a phone call. Dad, guess what? I joined church today. I don't know, just one day it just hit me. Life's really about to start, so I just want to live life in God's will. I started saying I want to do the right thing. I want to live right. When I see my son get dipped in that water, when he rises, he's going to be a new man. If I don't leave you, the Holy Spirit can't come. If I don't leave, the next blessing for you can't come. If I stay here, I'm going to block what God has in store for you. And Jesus presses on them that sometimes you've got to let me go in order for God to send the next blessing that is in store for your life. And somebody, you need to hear that today, that God may be calling you out to set up the next blessing. You better fight till you can't fight no more. Don't you let a doctor, a diagnosis, the enemy, your fear, keep you from living. I got two points and I'm done. Point number one, don't lose your fight. Point number two, don't lose your faith. Grab onto a board. Grab onto a broken piece and make it to the shore by any means necessary. I need somebody that got some fight left in you. Good evening, my brothers and sisters, and welcome again to Bible class. That's right. We're starting the fall 2022 year, and I'm glad that all of you are sharing with us and being a part of our class tonight and studying the Word of God with us. God is doing some great and amazing things in our midst, and we have the opportunity to be participants in the activities of heaven. Listen, we've got a lot going on. This weekend is going to be jam-packed. On Saturday morning at 9, I'm telling all the brothers that are sharing with me that we're going to be in the house Saturday morning for our monthly breakfast, and I hope you can come and be with us. Yeah, we'd love to have you come and share. For those who will be online, you can go right to the Zoom link and be a part of the class with us. We have breakfast together, laugh and joke, a major lesson. And I'm telling you, God's going to meet us there Saturday morning at 9. We go from about 9 to 11. Why? Because we eat. And those of you who will be online, you got to BYOB, bring your own breakfast and be a part of us then. Then at 1 o'clock, we're coming back together for our Harvest Fall Fest. We're inviting everybody to come up to the site, all of our members and friends. Bring your children in their costumes. You can wear yours. We're going to have game trucks and everything going on. It's going to be a great time out here. A lot of activities on the site. I'm believing God for some good weather starting at 1 o'clock. So hop in the car. The whole family, come on up to the site, and let's have a great time in 6020 Marion Drive. Now, this Sunday is Survivor Sunday. It's the last Sunday in the month that we salute those who have survived breast cancer and we educate those who don't know much about it. And so we're asking everyone to be in worship. And for those of you who have the picture of a loved one who survived or who struggled through cancer, we ask you to bring that with you Sunday. We want to take a moment and pause in our worship Sunday to salute all of those who have been climbing that rough side of the mountain. And we're trusting God and believing God for great things for each and every one of them. That's this coming Sunday morning, so I hope you'll be a part. And then next week, we start preparing ourselves emotionally, mentally, spiritually 
for new beginnings. I'm asking you to dedicate with me time every day. Declare it a fast. You fast from food, fast from television, fast from whatever it is that claims your attention and spend that time with God. Set aside how long it will be. Maybe it'll be a half hour, maybe an hour, maybe a morning and spend it with God. Maybe it'll be you get outside and you walk and you consider the heavens and the works of God's hands. But we're getting ready for new beginnings because a new beginning is starting. We're, doing, we're starting on election night. That's right, November the 8th and 9th is new beginnings here. And right now we're in the electoral season and I'm hoping everybody is reading the ballot that was mailed to you so you know what the issues are and you're preparing yourself to vote. Either vote early. I think early voting in Maryland starts today. Vote early or get that absentee ballot in on time or vote on the day of election and then be here that night at seven o'clock for new beginnings. God is gonna do some awesome things. Pastor Howard John Wesley is going to be preaching on that Tuesday night. I had an opportunity to talk with him, to share with him, and I want you to hear some of his thoughts about a new beginning. That's about what our life in Christ is, that there are moments and seasons when God brings us the opportunity for new beginnings. What triggers the awareness of that season is when the old things have passed away. If that truly is the case, then right here, right now, we are living in a season of new beginnings. COVID-19, a term we had never heard of, could never understand the ramifications of what it would do to the church, the kingdom of Christ, our world, our lives, has struck our doors. And a lot of what was old has passed away. We are living in a time now where things we used to know will never be again. Things we used to do may never return. The old really has passed away, which means now we stand at the cusp of a new beginning. And although that may excite us, and although that may bring us joy, it should also bring us a little concern. Because whenever God creates new season and new beginnings, we're also called to be good stewards of that. You've had an opportunity to listen to him, to Howard John Wesley. He's going to open us up. God's doing some mighty things. We've got to know who we are in Christ and who Christ is in us. Those are the two powerful questions we have to ask in this season. I'm believing God for some mighty things, but it's not going to be easy. There are hills to climb and there are valleys to go through. But next week, we are preparing ourselves to hear from God. I'm calling holy convocation. That's what New Beginnings is. It's holy convocation. When we come to the mountain of God, all roads will lead to 6020 Marion Drive. Everybody, everywhere, meet us here. You don't have to be a member of New Psalmist. You just sense something is in the air. Meet us here. You've been out campaigning that day. You've been helping with the election. Meet us here. You're on your job, word and considering of things that are happening. Meet us here because we're starting with what God is doing. New beginnings. And I'm believing God for some mighty, impressive work. And it's going to take us to be a part of it. So keep that in mind. New Beginnings is starting. All next week, we are preparing our hearts and minds, sending out texts and tweets and messages. I'll be sending out messages, sending out words that will encourage you every day. I'll be on every day, getting us ready for New Beginnings. Every day of next week, we'll have a morning moment to get ready for new beginnings, because God is doing a new thing. Behold, I do a new thing. God's doing a new thing, and I want everybody to be on hand. We're giving special gifts for new beginnings. You can do that even now, because God is moving in a powerful way. And I want you to dedicate your life, yourself, to this move of God, because it's going to be life-changing. Keep in mind, November 8th and 9th, New Beginnings. Well, let's get ready to go to the Word of God today. Father, in the name of Jesus, we gather before you to understand better your will and way in our lives. We come to Bible class, O oh God, that you might open for us insight and understanding. 
that we might know how to live the life you have called us to live powerfully and productively, and that we might be all you would have us to be. Speak now, Lord, your people listen, and let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Well, I need you to open your Bibles to the book of Joshua, chapter 24. Joshua, chapter 24. And I want you to come down to verse, really, I want to read verse 8 because it'll set part of the context. I brought you to the land of the Amorites. You lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them from before you, and you took possession of their land. When Balak, the son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you. But I would not listen to Balaam, so he blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did also the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Gereshites, Hivites, Jebusites, but I gave them into your hand. I sent the hornets ahead of you, which drove them out before you, also the two Amorite kings. You did not do it with your own sword and bow. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build. And, I get, and you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river in Egypt and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you'll serve whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in, whom, in whose land you were living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. I want to open this Bible lesson bringing us to grips with the moment of history that Israel is sharing. For 430 years, they were in captivity in Egypt. Why were they there? Because they went during the famine, during the days of Joseph. And when the famine ended, they did not return home. They stayed. And staying in a foreign land with foreign people, they became their prisoners, and they were enslaved. 430 years they lived in enslavement in Egypt until finally the cries of their pain, the tears and sorrow caused them to call on the name of the Lord and the Lord sent them a deliverer by the name of Moses. Moses comes to Israel by himself, well with his brother Aaron, no armies, no troops, nothing. And Egypt is the world-class imperial power. Moses comes and says, the Lord God of the Hebrews says, let my people go. And word reverberates through the Israeli community that there is someone here claiming to speak for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because that's how he was known then. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That is our God. But Moses comes and says, his name is I am, Yahweh. They knew him as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when Moses asked God on the Mount of Sinai, who should I say sent me, say I am that I am. The God who is sends you. And Moses comes back. Israel is skeptical of whether he'll be able to do anything. He's one man against the mightiest power they have ever known. But one man with God is greater than any force in the universe. And so Pharaoh's armies were defeated. And on the last of Moses' enactments, the death angel comes sweeping through the land and Pharaoh says, get your people and get out. That day they marched out of Egypt and marching out of Egypt, included in the number, were two young men, one by the name of Caleb, one by the name of Joshua. 
they came marching out of Egypt with the crowd. It took 40 years for them to get to the promised land, and everyone above age 20 that came out of Egypt with Moses died in the wilderness, except for two people who had faith in the early days to believe that all things are possible, Joshua and Caleb. They survived. That's another lesson, how they survived, what faith will do. But they survived. And Moses took Joshua as his apprentice, as his staff person, as the one to witness what God was doing, the one to carry forth the orders to the various generals and troops, and the one to prepare to step in to take over when Moses' day of departure would arrive. And it did arrive. And Joshua, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, we do not know his exact age coming out of, out of Egypt. We do not know if he was slightly above 20 or below 20. We do not know. Everyone above age 20 died except the two of them, so the only rationale is he was above 20. But now he is probably 60 or 70 years of age, and Moses is dead, and he has taken over, and he is now leading the children of Israel. The mantle of leadership has fallen on his shoulders. And he has successfully led them. Now, the Bible says at the end of chapter 23, and now they're 22 rather, and now they have rest. They've conquered the land, or at least been able to substantially establish their foothold in the new land and divvy it up among their people. And now Joshua advanced in years close to a hundred and something recognizes that his moment of service is winding down, but he cannot leave. He cannot pass the mantle on. He cannot step away from his leadership role without helping Israel understand what's coming. That a new era is dawning. They have been fighting and struggling for a long time. 40 years in the wilderness, some 10 years over, seven to 10 years over in the promised land. About 50 years they've been struggling since they left Egypt, and now a new chapter is about to start. They have rest in the land. It's a new beginning, but how will they face the new beginning? How will they handle this? And what Joshua does is tries to rehearse for them what they need in their memory bank as they go forward. He tries to put in context what God has done. Let me, let me share something I think that's so critical. Sometimes we don't understand the value of something until we have to do all the work with it ourselves. Let me see if I can explain this. I've been married 47 years, 47 years. Every day my wife fixes dinner, cooks, takes care of the meals, um, handles what we're going to eat, does the marketing and the like. And so I come home and just sit down and eat. But now that she's recovering from surgery, those responsibilities flip over to me. They're totally alien to me because all I did was enjoy the food that was prepared. I never thought about what goes into preparing it or how much time you have to take or what kind of pieces of meat or, or, or chicken or fowl or fish you have to buy. I never thought about it. I only ate. I only ate. I didn't think about uh, whether I have the ingredients for this or that I just ate. And most of us handle life that way and especially God that way. As long as God is doing everything for us, handing it to us, we, we just enjoy it. And seldom do we stop to think what goes into making our God life happen. Because it doesn't just happen. Food doesn't just get on the table. Somebody has to prepare it. Somebody has to buy it. Food doesn't just walk out of the refrigerator and sit on a plate. Somebody has to cook it. 
Somebody has to watch it. There's so many steps involved. And so often in our dealing with God, we're just so accustomed to dealing with the blessing that God is throwing our way that we never stop to think about what it takes to get there. Joshua is aware that a new beginning is starting in Israel's life. Some of the old things will be gone. They will not be just fighting wars every day. They will be living in a new environment and a new reality. They will be building their cities and they will be occupying the land. And so their focus will be different. And Joshua says, with a new beginning happening in your lives, the first thing I have to do is call you back to memory. I, I wondered, Joshua's up in age, and he does not call for a retirement celebration. He does not call for a party. He brings the people together to prepare them for the next chapter of their lives. And he doesn't seek to prepare them by giving them some kind of essay on the land a geological um, survey of the land. He does not come reporting as the 12, the, te the 12 spies had done on what is in the new land. That is not what they need to understand with their new beginning. Noah taught us that with a new beginning, you need to understand this is the grace of God because God gives second chances, third chances, and fourth. And new beginnings are new chances with God. Moses taught us that sometimes God sends us into some distant places to get our head right because we can't take on the new will if we're still stuck in the old way. But Joshua has something different. Joshua says you can't go forward until you have a full appreciation of the past. The new beginning, the new job, the new house, the new career, the new family, the new identification, the new responsibilities cannot really be appreciated or maximized. You cannot reach your maximum potential unless you have a full understanding of the past. And so what Joshua does when he calls them together, he says, the Lord says for me to tell you this. This is what the Lord says. He didn't just try to awe them with his own knowledge. And one of the things you and I have got to really focus on, concentrate on, and get back to is understanding we don't speak for ourselves. We speak for God. And go back and rehearse what the Lord has said. Jo Joshua opens in that 22nd and 23rd chapter and then into the 24th chapter when he's meeting with all of Israel, when he has assembled all of the tribes at Shechem. He's brought them to their religious place. He's brought them to the place where they meet God, the elders, the leaders, the judges, the officials. And he presents them. He presents them before God. In other words, he says, we do not go into the future without first standing with God that new chapters are always begun with God. God's not an afterthought of anything new that's happening in our lives. That's, listen, on New Year's Eve, we gather for church, and, and in the former tradition, we would gather for church at around 10 o'clock. Why? Because in the Baptist church, church lasts all night, so we had to move it back from 11 o'clock to, to 10 o'clock. So you could have church because at five of 12, we're going on our knees. And what are we going to do? We're going to pray out the old year and pray in the new year. We're going to have God stand with us when we say good night and have God be with us when we say good morning. We're going to have God with us when we wave farewell to this chapter and the thoughts that that farewell brings. And we're going to have God with us when we wave hello to the next chapter and the thoughts that that hello brings. Before we focus on anything, we recognize who stands with us, God. He is the alpha, which means the beginning, and the omega, 
the beginning and the end. And they presented themselves before God. They presented themselves before God. They, they come into his presence. They stand before him. They, they recognize the royalty. They present themselves to he who is the king of kings. They present themselves to God. I, I love that. And Joshua says to all the people, because he is the spokesman for God, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. And I, I love how he starts. He doesn't just start with yesterday. Long, long ago, your ancestors, he goes back to the father of Abraham, including Tira, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates River, river and worship other gods. But I took your father Abraham from the land beyond the Euphrates and led him throughout Canaan and gave him many descendants. In other words, I gave your ancestor Abram a new beginning, a new point of departure, a new launching place. You know, most of us like to see our lives as just a continual build up. But every now and then you ought to see your life as having the opportunity of a new beginning. The new you, the you that has grown, that has come to a new spiritual awareness, that has been through fire and flood, is now given a new beginning. That's why we talk about being born again. I don't always see my life as just a continuum. I, I do see the fullness when I look from 40,000 feet as a continuum. But when I'm living it, I see it as points. Points. And I'm here. And I don't just get here, I grow to here. I don't just get here, I grow to here. I didn't just get to 72 from 71, I grew to 72. I learned some new things, some new understandings, and that grew me there. And when I got to 72, I then had some new beginnings, some new opportunities come that were brand new. And, and they were new, and I was new for them, just like you are new for them. God gives us new beginnings, new places. From 40,000 feet, I look like I'm just traveling on one continuum. From general aviation, from the top of a building, I see myself stop here and here and here. And in between are the periods of growth. I'm growing through time till I reach my next end of this and beginning of that. You are growing through time till you reach your end of this and beginning of that. What I'm really saying is there's some places you're arriving at now. You could only arrive at now because you've grown to get there. If that place so improbable had been in your life some 10 years ago, it would not have been a new beginning for you. It would have been the end for you because you would not have known how to handle it. But the new you knows how to handle the new space. I don't know who I'm talking to in Bible class tonight, but the new you understands how to handle the new space that God has you in. And so Joshua calls them together and then he speaks for God. The Lord God told me to tell you this. Told me to tell you that he claimed you. He claimed your father Abraham. I gave him Isaac and I gave and, I, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country to Sierra to Esau and Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. He rehearses the history. He brings them all together as they leave one chapter, the chapter of war, and begin to go into the chapter of community building. The chapter of fighting for the right to the chapter of community building. He brings them together to remember, to remember, I brought you through this and I'm taking you to this. That is critical especially in the age in which we're living. The civil rights era was the era of fighting. 
the era that preceded or came after that is the era of community building. But if you don't understand the God of fighting and the God of community building, you will not know who to call on to build the community, nor will you understand how you won the fight. And the enemy never dies. And before you know it, the very reality of this text will begin to catch you. Israel has fought. They have won battles. They have divvied up the land. The land is now in the hands of the tribes. Joshua has called them all together to tell them a new day is beginning. This is the day of community building. This is the day of setting up not a wartime economy, but a peacetime economy. This is the time to live and in your living to glorify God. In your living to glorify God. But what he is aware of is that folk have just eaten of the blessings of God. They don't know anything about cooking. They don't know anything about serving God, really loving God, and knowing God. And what he fears is that they will start worshiping the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. That you will start doing what they do. You were supposed to drive them out, but you didn't drive all of them out. You kept some of them around. And the fear is, you will start following their gods. Their gods that promise crops. Their gods that promise seed time and harvest. Their gods that promise rain. Their gods that promise sunshine. Their gods that promise uh, deliverance from sickness, just as the gods of Egypt. Just as the gods of Egypt. But remember, Moses enacted plagues in Egypt, and every plague was directed at the perceived power of one of the gods of Egypt. And in every time, the Lord God Jehovah prevailed. And now Mo Joshua is saying to them, I know you all are enjoying this new land, but there's a danger of becoming enticed by what the, Am the land of the Amorites. You were enslaved in the land of Egypt, but you're going to be enticed in the land of the Amorites. In the land of Egypt, you were the slave. In the land of the Amorites, you are the captors. and You will like what's going on and you will participate in it. And you will take on the gods of this land. He said, but I've come and brought you to this space because I need to tell you. I need to get something straight and I want you to understand, as for me and my house, we are not going back to slavery nor are we going to be subtly enticed in the new land where we are. We are staying with the God of our salvation. Joshua says, I brought you to this place, and I'm rehearsing for you how we got here. We didn't get here from strong armies. We didn't get here by our might. We got here by God. We're going to go forward with God. We close a chapter with God. We open a chapter with God. Now, I need somebody to get that. I don't know what's going on in your life, but God sent me to tell you, close a chapter with God, open chapters with God. Never let there be space in between. In mathematics and trigonometry, we talk about the tangent where one spot, one circle touches another circle. And that little spot is the tangent where you can flow from one right to the other. Well, you flow from your past through the tangent of God into your present and future. You flow from your past into the tangent of the present into your future when you do it with God. When you do it with God. He, he assembles them. He says, now God gave you stuff you didn't even build. He gave you cities you didn't build, vineyards you didn't plant. He's given you all of that. Don't get enticed with these gods of the Amorites. Now that you live in large, don't think you can live without God. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Now we're talking about new beginnings in this season. And Joshua is trying to get the children of Israel aware that you're coming out of war, out of a season of war, into a season of peacetime. You're coming out of, you're coming out of fighting for your rights into community development. You're coming from fighting the enemy into developing the community. And because you're Israel, there will be people in your land who are not of you, but your job is to bring them into you by showing them the magnitude of your faith. The magnitude of your faith. But you're entering a new 
season of community building, of community building. And it is God who has brought you here. And, and what Joshua is trying to get them to realize and to understand that new beginnings mark new chapters. I'm talking to somebody here tonight. New beginning, a new chapter is in your life. A new chapter is beginning. Somebody said, I just had a 60th birthday. That's a new chapter. Oh, a new chapter is beginning. I just got my Social Security card or my Social Security check. That's a new chapter. A new chapter in your life has begun. We just brought the baby home from the hospital. That's a new chapter. That's a new chapter. I have to take these pills. That's a new chapter. I'm getting ready to retire. I'm changing jobs. I'm founding a company. That's or those are new chapters. You close one chapter with God. You open the new chapter with God. That is what he's trying to get us to realize. And in these, these moments, how we open and close the chapters are defining moments for us. You know, I, I know a lot of persons who get tremendously blessed, new opportunity, but never stop and pause to spend quality time with the God who's brought them. They don't open the chapter with God. They don't open the chapter with God. I remember when we bought our home, I had made a conscious vow that I was going to do something different. When we bought the first house and, and, and I learned this lesson, I, 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 I don't always apply it to the depth that I should, but it calls me back from the crippling place of forgetting. I remember we needed this, that, and or the other, and thinking to myself, we got to get this, we got to get that, we got to get the other. When we moved in this house, the night before in the morning of the move, I went over to the house. And I just sat in the rooms. No curtains, because you know, African American people, first thing they say is, we got to put curtains up. We got to put something at the windows. That's the first line in the African American community when you get a piece of property, a home, an apartment, or something. We got to get curtains. And I sat in every room. I just sat down in the room and celebrated God making this happen. I didn't celebrate by saying God did. No, I celebrated with him. My conversation was with him, not about him. It was God, you, not my God did. No, 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 no. This was a connection with God. You've given us this. We had to fight to get here. Now we build from here. The war ended with your banner. The new chapter begins with your praise. Sitting in the house, room by room by room, no curtains, nothing. Just saying, God did this. You did this for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for making a way. Thank you. Joshua is preparing the people for the new beginning, letting them know that individually they must do this. He's having a conversation with them, and he's letting them know where he is in this. Just like you have to have conversation with your children, with, with your friends and family and others. But he's saying, every time you have this major new beginning, you need to have this assembly. He's calling everybody in the system that is his together and says, God did all this for us. God has opened up a new chapter in our lives. God has made a way. And the only question, the only question with this new horizon breaking on our lives is this, how will we handle it? We are at the beginning of a new chapter. Sometimes that moment is forced upon us, but we must rise to the occasion when it does. My friend, who now rests in the presence of the Lord, Congressman Elijah Cummins, taught me a poem, oh my God, it must be almost near 40 years ago, but I've never forgotten. Only just a minute, hmm. 60 seconds in it. 
forced upon me, got to use it, I must suffer. If I lose it, give account if I abuse it. It's only just a minute, but eternity is in it. How are you going to handle this moment? It's forced upon you, got to lose it, you must suffer if you abuse it. It's only just a minute, but eternity is in it. Joshua calls them together and says, look, we got to start this out right. A new beginning is happening. A new chapter is coming in your life. You got to start it out right. You just got elected. You, you just won the election. A new, a new chapter starts. You got to start it out right. You survived the surgery. You came through the cancer. You got to start this chapter out right. And not only start it out right, you got to live it right. You got to live it right. That sagely leader stood in Shechem and called all the leaders and the elders and the judges and the officials to hear his final words and to set the course for their future. Israel is finished with the wilderness. Her time of desperation is over. Her warfare is ended. And now a new future awaits her. And I'm sure there's a mixture of emotions welling up inside of Joshua. This must have been an unbelievable moment for him. He had come so far with them, and yet there was still so far to go. He's looking forward to the next chapter, but he's also very much aware of what it will take for that next chapter to come to pass. This is for everybody, for Joshua and for Israel, a new beginning. And he's going into a new season. And so are the people. But he's making it clear that he and his family, he and his clan, are going into the future with the God of their past. With the God of their past. They are, they are not divorcing God from what's coming, from what's happening from the opportunity. They are, he is intricately tying God to the ongoingness of his life. He is not putting God over here where I go to church on Sunday, I pray, I fast, and God is the one who makes sense out of my life. No, he is putting God squarely in to the moments of his life. My future, my steps are in your hand. I'm going into the present with the God of the past. The God who brought me here is going to take me into this new beginning. I'm not going into this new beginning on my skills, my ability, just looking around. No, 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 no. I came to the end of the old with God, and I'm at the beginning of the new with God. So if I'm in a meeting with my new bosses, God is here with me. If I'm walking through the new house, God is here with me. If I'm riding in the new car, God is here with me. If I'm fighting a new battle, God is here with me. If I picked up a new client, God is here with me. I am not here by myself. God is here with me. He is here by my side, just like he was with Moses, so he is with me. Just like he was with Abraham, so he is with us. God empowered us through the wilderness, empowered us in the journey, opened both the Red Sea and the Jordan, gave us the will and the way to conquer the land. He's been faithful. Now we're in a new land, flowing with milk and honey. The manna is gone. The quail no longer fall out the sky. We live off the land. We live among a people with different practices and who have worshiping different gods. This new promotion has put me among people who are a little strange and a little different from me. They have a different ethic and they seem to have different purposes at hand. But they've been able to convince a whole lot of other folk, many of those who were numbered in with us coming through the Red Sea and through the Jordan River. They've, con they've convinced many folk to follow their practices. They're bougie and buppy and trying to act like they look down their nose on others. Hmm. 
My God. Israel's out of the old life. And think about us. We're no longer teenagers living at home. No, 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 no. Our youngsters have gone off to college and able to do their own thing. They were no longer being told to get up and get ready for church. Their church service could be a gospel song on their way to a brunch with their friends. Joshua knew the issue is not where have we come from. Christian children coming from Christian friends. That's not the issue. Most everyone would affirm that we've come a long way, even as a people. We've come from slavery to freedom. We've come from being the means of production to being entrepreneurs and being producers. We've come from shotgun houses to suburban dwellings. We, like Israel, admit that we've come a long way. They knew the historical facts of their history. They knew the names of Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Fannie Lou Hamer, so, uh, Fred Shuttlesworth, Hosea Williams, C.T. Vivian, Ralph Abernathy, Martin King, Emmett Till. We know the history, the events. We know how black people have gotten here. We, we know civil rights acts. We, we know the 14th and 13th Amendment, 15th Amendment. But my brothers and sisters, this is the point Joshua is trying to get Israel to see, and I'm trying to get you to see, because we've moved from the period just of fighting for our rights, which we are seeing we're going to have to go back to doing. And why? Because we didn't understand the blessing that was ours. To building community. But we didn't always do it at, with God at the end and the beginning of the other. We know our history. The movie Emmett Till is out right now. We, if we don't know it, you can see it. You can see our history. We know of his murder. We know of Medgar Evers being shot. We know of Malcolm X being murdered. We know of Martin King being shot on a Memphis balcony. We know our history to some extent. We know the Carter G. Woodson, the Charles Drews. We, we, we know some of our history. The Booker T. Washingtons, the... the the voices, we know all of them, those names. We know Murray McLeod Bethune. Those are the historical events. But our history is not a summary of events. That's what Joshua was trying to teach. That's why he says, as for me and my house. Our history is not a summary of events. It is what Joshua was working so hard to remind the people. In German, there's a word called, word called Helgeschet. And it means salvation history. It means seeing history through the lens of God's movement, culminating in his son coming to rescue us from our sins. That everything in history is a move of God bringing us out of darkness into light, out of bondage into freedom. It is an interpretation of history. Now get what I'm going to say. Write this down. Write this down in the chat that emphasizes God's saving acts. Don't look at your history. Don't, don't review your history as just a series of events. They made it through all their experiences, the Red Sea, the Jordan River, bitter waters, armies attacking, battle upon battle, because God was there, intervening on their behalf and working his way to bring them to the desired future. This is what Jeremiah meant when he said, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Everything that's happening in your life and my life is a part of God's salvation history. It is a part of Hell's Geshevka, salvation history. I don't want anybody to write my biography. I want them to do what the song says, if anyone could ever write my life story, for whatever reason there might be, between each line of pain and glory, they'd find Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. I don't have a story if you take God out of it. 
The string of events makes no sense. The string of events are almost perilous to my progress. What makes sense is the hand of God orchestrating my steps and my stops. What makes sense in your life is the hand of God orchestrating your steps and your stops. While you're in the kitchen eating dinner, just sitting there eating, it doesn't make sense. But when you stop to realize what it takes to cook the meal, when, it stops, when you stop to realize what it take or took to get you where you are, how God had to orchestrate events, moments, situations, how he had to plan long before you were born that you could arrive at a certain destination at a certain time. Sometime it was the place you did not want to be, but it became the place that opened up the opportunity for you to be who you are right now. Everything is about God saving acts in our lives. God saving acts in our lives. From the beginning, God has been involved. Israel's history was not just a mountain of mountains. It was the word of the psalmist being confirmed. The Lord guides our steps. And as W.A. Jones says, if he watches my steps, he also knows my stops. And let me take this a step further. This is a moment for African-American people, and especially during this election time. We've come through the pandemic and are ready to leap into a new life and new opportunity. But we are becoming enamored with the gods of the Amorites. God, God has been training us since our earliest struggles to understand that our value is not seen outside of us, but inside of us. He has been toughening us up. He has been making, giving us beauty for ashes. He has been strengthening us, bolding us. And yet the Amorite land would try to tell us that we need to dress up in Saul's armor to fight Saul, to fight Goliath. The Amorites would tell us that we need to impress, that our output is more important than our impact, that the forces outside of us are greater than the forces that work through us. That's what the Amorite land would tell us. That's what America would tell us. It would tell us to build our hope on fluffy stuff. To, to try to be identified as being in the know when we know nothing. One of the funny things that tickles me is people want to be influencers until they get sued. They want to be influencers until somebody asks them the real depth of questions that go along with what they're trying to be influenced about. The real value of who we are and who God is structuring us to be is not if we can persuade somebody but if we can open the door to somebody's thinking to something they've not thought before and experienced something they've not experienced before. And that's internal. That's internal. God has been the force behind our deliverance and every bit of our advance. There is no reason to believe that we will make progress without God. That's what Joshua's trying to tell them. He brought us through the Middle Passage. He brought us through the dark night of slavery. He sustained us through the indignations of Jim Crow. He sent us the liberating army of civil rights champions who hazarded their lives for our progress. He alone can keep us against the multitude of forces that are rising now. Our history is a national story of a personal relationship with God not just some fortuitous sling of events, not just some accidental happenings, but we are the conscious effort of the creative mind of God. And each of us, each of us, you, 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 right in the chat, me, each of us must admit that our individual history is not just a summary of events. It is our personal experience of and with the God who has made himself known to us. Child, I'll shout on that. I feel like doing a dance. I feel like doing a dance on that. That's what he's trying to get us to say. He's proclaiming to us who he is. Joshua says, now let me, Joshua says, I got to take it a step further. 
He says, now y'all can decide who you're going to serve. Either you're going to go back and serve these little gods that tell you all this stuff is out here, get it, and that'll make you somebody, or you can stay with the one who has internally showed you that all things are possible, who has given you the intestinal fortitude to stand up against any force that comes against you and to know that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He said, but let me tell you, as for me and my house, we going to serve the Lord. We are staying with the God who brought us. The gods of Egypt, no, y'all can have them. The gods of the Amorites, y'all can have them. The gods of Egypt enslaved you. The gods of the Amorites have enticed you. But I'm staying with the God who has empowered us. I'm staying with the God who has empowered me. I was, I was a nobody from, from, from Goshen. And now I'm leading the land. How did I get here? Because the good hand of the Lord was upon my life. I'm staying with the God of our history and affirming it with the practices of our faith. I'm, going, I'm not going with the gods of the Amorites. I'm not practicing their faith. I'm staying with the God of Israel because the way you know your faith is how you walk in it. And then, then this is where it gets critical because this is why this verse is so important. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That little verse, you know, has been quoted so many times and lifted up so many times. So many people have used it. And, and we use it, up, you know, on Children's Day, Father's Day, Mother's Day, you know, when we're doing a little speech. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And we see the wife and the children, the husband and the children sitting right out there at little automatons who are following the dictatorial guide of their parents. I say, go church, you go church. I say, sit down, you sit down. I say, rise, you rise. But let me go back to the opening part of the lesson. We're dealing with folk now who are grown, you know, who, who no longer have to get up when you say get up. They're not even all living in your house. Some of them are away. Some of them live in other cities. Some of them are in schools and other places. They, they don't hear you saying, come on, we're going to church this morning. We're going to do this or we're going to do that or we're going to do the other. They are living in the land of the Amorites. They are living in the land of the Amorites. And the Amorites are trying to entice them. The God of Israel is trying to empower them. The God of the Amorites is trying to entice them. The God of the Israelites is giving them a new beginning and showing them to look inside themselves at the hand of God upon their lives. The hand of the Amorites is telling them there's an opportunity for them, but they need to pick up these pieces from the Amorite world in order to maximize it. You need to be an Amorite to enjoy Amorite pleasures. Help me somebody. Joshua says, but as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. We are staying with the Lord. And this is what blew my mind. Joshua was, Joshua was 100 and about 105. So rest assured, he doesn't have any little children running around. There's nobody six or seven running around his house. So, so that, that vision we have of this family sitting on the pew, husband, wife, two and a half kids, sitting right there, one with a crayon in his hand, coloring on paper. Another one eating a cracker. No, 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 no. I need you to visualize this. Joshua sitting there with Mrs. Joshua. Beside Joshua, all of his children who are probably in their 70s and 80s. Beside them are all of their children who are probably in their 40s and 50s. 30s. Below them are all of their children who are probably in their teens or 20s. And below them are the newborns. He says, as for me and this house, we are serving the Lord. In other words, get this. He is saying, and this is the part you got to get at for me and my house, in this new beginning. God's giving all of us new beginnings. And this is how we've got to approach him. He's saying, as he's well advanced in age, that generations are committed to this choice. Oh, God, y'all missed it. It's not just about me being committed to being a Christian. One of the things I used to hear when I was growing up, and I saw it a lot, too, when persons were committed to being in church, you know, pastor of a church or a deacon or this, that, but their children couldn't stand church. 
now and they, they would all say yeah and they would they would suffer as if to say the devil had snuck them off or something wasn't right or whatever but that's not the plan of god joshua hits it as for me and my house we're going to serve the lord there will be generations following god generate I, i'm not the first in my generation following him my, my mom and daddy followed him. Their mama and daddy followed him. This is a generational progression. And what you and I need to start thinking about is not a surreptitious or superfluous generational connection, but we need to be talking about is there a quality connection in each generation. Joshua is standing boldly declaring, I'm speaking for them, and they are standing up, backing up what I'm saying. As for me and my house, my clan, my generation, my legacy is not that I got you out of the land of the wilderness and across the Jordan in here. My legacy is that our faith in God goes forward into the third and fourth and fifth generation. A new beginning is a new opportunity to push this further along. You don't take new beginnings, new opportunities that come. I, I remember all the new opportunities in my life, not all of them, but many of them, the new opportunity, the new beginning when I left sixth grade and went to uh, Garrison Junior High School, one of about four blacks in my class. New beginning, all new environment. Going to Baltimore Polytechnic Institute, one year younger than all of the starting sophomores, but going there to, to study at Polytechnic, that was a new beginning. For leaving Polytechnic, going to the University of Maryland, College Park, new beginning. Leaving there, getting a job in a major company in Baltimore, new beginning. Leaving that, going back to graduate school and getting my master's degree and first working on one degree and then transferring to another degree and then getting a third degree, then being working at New Shiloh Church, new beginning, and then getting called to New Psalmist, new beginnings. But every one of them was a part of my salvation history and every one of them started with and stayed with and was anchored in the God of my salvation, whether I fully comprehended it or not. Learning lessons like when you take an exam, when you take an exam, don't ask God to help you pass. Ask him to help you remember what you studied. Why? Because that way you will study. Sitting in an exam, talking to God before it, walking across campus, praying to God, going on a new job, asking God to help it work thinking you about to be laid off and get a promotion, having talked to God just before the big meeting. And God, instead of you getting laid off, you get promoted. Help me somebody. Getting called to a church, the, the, the dream of pastoring, and having God walk you along the steps. He says, we learn generationally to pass this thing on. His sons and daughters have sons and daughters, and the grace and anointing is being passed from one generation to the other. My God, that's what he's saying. It's not just the little children. Because guess what? Some of us who said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The little children ain't serving the Lord now that they're grown. They are not serving the Lord now that they're grown. Joshua can make that statement. Oh, let me see if I can help you as we get ready to wind this down. See, we want to teach our children and we want them to experience a lot, but never segregate or separate that experiencing and that teaching and their new beginnings from the God of their history. Always incorporate the new opportunities in their salvation history. This is what the Lord is doing in your life. My God, ha have we tried to model that practice of faith? Or have we become obsessed 
with the opportunities of the Amorites? Have we tried to model, have we tried to model the practices of our faith? I, I know a lot of our practices need to change, but all of them don't. I'm going to church on Sunday. I model going to church on Sunday. There's nothing to me more important than going to church on Sunday. Now we have the opportunity on the internet. You can go to church on the internet. When I go away on vacation, I go to church on Sunday. I've told you before, my children probably hated it, hated it. We were moving into the dormitory, moving children into the dormitory. And the schools move in on Sunday. But we never moved in until after church. Why? Because I'm passing this practice on that nothing comes before the worship of Almighty God. I'm passing on the practice when they were having struggles and strife. I sat there and listened to them and sat there with them and work with them to understand how God's going to help you. God's going to make a way. Why? Because one day I'm going to be gone, and the gods of the Amorites are not going to help them. They need the God of their history. Oh, God, our help in ages past. They need the God of their salvation. Uh, God dropped this line on me. I dropped it in the service the other Sunday or Sunday past. I mean, I, I was working on the sermon and the Lord just gave me this sentence and it just scared me because I, I, I got scared to write it. I, I got scared to, to, to even admit it. I, I got scared to say it. But it's true. We have all these modern conveniences now. We can worship online. We can do Bible study online. God knows I love doing Bible study online. Right down in the chat, I love coming online. And we're getting ready to close out in a few minutes. I can see my team telling me, come on, Pastor, close it down. But I got to give you this. But I had to write this down. I had to really start thinking about it. I, I, I can't update all the practices that I have. Some of the things do need to change, but some things I'm sticking with. I'm sticking with the goodness of the Lord, the loving kindness of the Lord. I'm sticking with praising him every chance I get. I'm sticking with having my time with him, my devotional time with him, my prayer walk with him. I'm not getting rid of any of those. I'm, I'm not updating that. I, I, I'm keeping that as it is. I, I agree. There are a lot of things that I may update, like we're doing Bible study tonight right here online. That's update. But there's some things I'm keeping. But God dropped this line on me because I think this goes to the quality of our understanding what it takes to pass on the meaning of God in our lives to the different generations and to help them interpret their lives in terms of salvation history. Here's the question. It's a simple question because, and it will define a lot about us. When you see a conflict, when it comes to missing worship or Bible study or, um, or your morning devotions or anything, when you see there's a conflict rising, I, or if there's a conflict, I can't make it to new beginnings. If there's a conflict, if you see there's a conflict rising, when do you? No. When you see that conflict, do you stop and take time and make the time to make sure you reschedule yourself to be able to do that? For example, say, say next Thursday you can't do Bible study. Say, say something comes up. You, you have to take your child to school. You, you have to help your mother. You have, to, um, you have to work late. You can't do Bible study at 7 o'clock. When you realize that, what time will you write down to reschedule so you can be in Bible class? Will you say, well, I can't do it at 7. I'm going to do it at 9. Or will you say, I just missed this week? Let me tell you something. When we miss a show on television, you know what we do most times? Before we watch the next episode, we go back and watch the last one. We'll even say to ourselves, I'm going to watch it on Sunday night. I didn't get to see The Real Housewives. I, I, I didn't get to see uh, uh, The Good Doctor on Monday, so I'm going to watch it on. Well, do we do God that way? God's been the author and the finish of our salvation history. If, if I can't go to church on Sunday, can we do worship on Monday night? I'm going to do worship on Monday night. No, I can't do this other stuff. I'll be in worship on Monday night. What, well, your church worships on Monday night? No, I wasn't able to be there yesterday. So I'm going to be there tonight and worship. 
And what will your children do when they see, well, Mama, how come you, you, you doing church tonight? Well, remember, yesterday I had to take you to patient first, so I wasn't able to be in worship. But we're in worship tonight, so come on, let's, let's do worship tonight. That's how Joshua got his family to pass it on from one generation to the other. Each generation saw how important it was to the one before and understood that their history was a salvation history. When I look back at the moments growing up in a reality so different from this, when we didn't have medicines and whatever, when the doctor would often bring the medicine to the house, when I saw my mother do what I call miraculous surgery, take a bean that was shot down my brother's ear and bring it out, and we knew that was nobody but God. Or see God look at my history at 12 years old, catching the bus from Cherry Hill every day for the, for the next many years that I was in junior high school and senior high school, catching the bus from Cherry Hill at 12 years of age by myself, the salvation history of God watching over me and protecting me. Oh, my brothers and sisters, when I look at going to South Africa by myself on the cusp of apartheid, with no one beside me, no one with me, no adjutants, no Joshua, no Walter, no Odell, no Al traveling with me, no Chris. Salvation history. Salvation history. And as for me and my house, when we enter the new beginning, we will serve the Lord. Well, I got to end there. Joshua has these clans all behind him because every generation has seen the generation before it. I remember sitting at the dining room table every Sunday and my father reading the Bible my brother and I having to quote our scripture verses, and then we had prayer. I remember every Sunday morning having to get up and get dressed and go to church. And as a young adult, going off to college, partying hard on Friday and Saturday night, and Sunday morning, getting up, making my way to the chapel at University of Maryland. Why? Because that's what we do. I know the only reason I'm here is because of the good hand of the Lord. My daddy couldn't afford all of this tuition, but God has made a way for my bill to be, be paid. Be paid. I remember riding to work praying, God, let me get home in this car that's clinking along. Everything passed on from one generation to the next. Don't let anybody in your sphere, think that the new opportunity that's been given them, the new beginning that is happening in their space is anything other than a continuation of the good hand of the Lord upon their lives. Let them get excited about God and look forward to the events that he unfolds in their lives. Well, that's it. That's it. I hope somebody got something. I hope you got it. Hope you got, I hope you understand now what we have to do in our households and how we have to do it. We start the new chapter just the way we close the last one. God's helped us tie the ribbon on the boat and open the snap on the new one. And he walks with us through it. We grow through every season to the new beginnings that God gives us. Don't forget, Saturday morning Bible class for the brothers. Then at 1 o'clock, our Harvest Fest, we hope everybody is out. It's going to be a time up on the campus. Sunday morning is our Survivor Sunday. We're looking for everybody. I'll be preaching. I'm excited. Sunday afternoon, we're installing Pastor Monique Lemon right here at New Psalmist. She's being installed at 4 o'clock. I hope you'll be out to see her installation. I'll be preaching. Oh, it's going to be a great time. And then next week, all next week, we're getting ready. We're getting ready for new beginnings with Pastor Howard John Wesley, Pastor Reggie Sharp. It's going to be off the chain. So let's put it on the calendar and let's get ready for it. God's doing some mighty things. Tweet it out, text it out, tell everybody. Bring everybody with you. I want to see who can bring the most people with them to new beginnings. We're going to give our offerings now, ushers. Are you ready? 
The ushers say they're ready. All you have to do is click on Give Lafay, Push Pay, or the New Psalmist website. Or you can go right on the site they're on probably and give from there. But we're giving our offerings to the Lord right now. I want you to, you can label it Bible class. If you're writing a check, you can mail it to New Psalmist Baptist Church, 6020 Marion Drive, Baltimore, Maryland, 21215. It's being shown now in Baltimore, Maryland, 21215. Text it to push pay, or rather text it to 77977. Then in the message line, NPBC space dollar amount. And then you can use Givelify or PushPay or our website to give your offerings. So let's give now to support the work that God is doing here. He's doing some mighty work here. I'm looking forward to seeing all of you in the weeks that come. But keep in mind, as for you and your house, you will serve the Lord. Father, hear our prayer now. Take the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart and let them be acceptable in your sight. Let your word come alive. Let the truth be magnified and let Jesus Christ be praised. God, walk with us in every today and open the door for every tomorrow and help us to realize that in order for this to be a generational commitment, we have to instill it as a generational truth. Help us to cultivate the faith of our children that they might praise the faith of their fathers. This we ask in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ, and together we say amen. God bless you, my brothers and sisters. Love you much. Take care now.